Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. God is worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy to be praised. He's worthy to be praised. Give God some real glory in this house, for this is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Bless the name of the Lord, for he is worthy of praise. We give God praise, honor, and glory for allowing us to come to see another day in which we've not seen before to our musicians, to our preachers, to our choir members, our administrators, our audio and video people, to my family, of course, First Lady Kim, all of you, brothers, sisters in Christ, it is good to be in the house of the Lord once again. Amen. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Not the way we normally do it, but just the fact that we can still do ministry is a blessing from on high. Today, as we prepare our hearts and minds to go before the Lord, we're praying for the sick and the shut-in family. You may be seated. We're praying for the sick, for the shut-in, for those who are laid out on beds of affliction today those who are struggling through and trying to get past whatever it is that they're dealing with, we're asking that you all continue to pray for Brother Terrence Bowman. We ask that you continue to pray for Deacon Richard Clark, who I heard is supposed to be released from the hospital this weekend. Amen. So I heard. Amen. Prayers are working. Prayers are working. Prayers are working. We're still praying for Sister Evelyn Mitchell, Sister Kathleen Overturf. Praying for Brother James Ridgeway, Sister Talia White. We're still praying for Minister Keziah Daniels, who is still recovering from COVID. And then I ask that you all pray for Sister Justine Caceres. Her grandfather has now tested positive for COVID and is in the hospital. So I'm asking that you all pray for Sister Justine. We're praying for the bereaved hearts, as we mentioned on last week, that uh, the McGee family has lost a family member to COVID. And we're praying that God would comfort them in the midst of this current storm in which they are dealing with as well. Listen, we're praying for this country. We're in such need of prayer in this country. I don't think in my adult life, I've never seen our country more divided, more on opposite sides of the track than what I see now. And it's not economic, though that's always been a challenge. This is a racial divide. It's important if you've not registered yet to vote Please get the word out to any and all of your family members and friends. Now, you know I'm not a social media person, but if I was on all of my social media accounts, I would encourage people to vote. Tweet that out. Instagram that. Facebook that. Tag that to all your friends, all your family members. We need to show up at the polls and vote. Now listen, I'm not going to tell you who to vote for, though if you catch me at the right time, I may offer some words of wisdom, amen, but we need to vote. We need to vote. I'm asking that you all would inspire and encourage others to take the time out to vote. Come with me before the Lord as we go to him in prayer, asking his blessings upon us today, that he would touch all that we put our hands to. God, our Father, how we bless and how we praise Thee. How we thank Thee, Lord God, for another day in which we've not seen before. How we bless Thee, Lord God, because You've blessed us to get up this morning. Use of our extremities, clothed in our right minds. God, You've blessed us, Lord, to have a desire in our hearts to do the work of ministry. God, how we thank Thee. We thank You that we can worship You today. We thank You that we can praise You today. We thank You, Lord God, that we can exalt You today. God, we pray that You would forgive us of our sins. Things that we've done, Lord God, that is so unbecoming. Christian men and Christian women. How we've missed the mark. How we've come up short.
But God, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. That if we're willing to confess our sins before you, that you're willing to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God, we ask a blessing upon the kingdom today, all of those who are called according to your purpose. God, touch right now. Inspire right now. Encourage right now, Lord God. Lift up the bowed down heads of your people. Remind them, Lord, that you're still operating. You're still moving. You're still blessing. You're still touching. You're still still speaking to even a now generation in spite of all that's going on around us. God, we ask a blessing upon sick and shutting. Those, Lord God, where pain and illness and disease, viruses has invaded their bodies. Touch them right now, Lord. Let them know you're still in the blessing business. We thank you for the testimonies of those who are recovering. We bless you, Lord God, that you heard the prayers of your people, that you inclined your ear unto us and gave us the desires of our heart. Now, God, there are still others. We pray for them today, Lord God. We call their names before you today, Lord God. We ask that you touch them right now. Allow them to feel your presence like never before. Ask a blessing upon the bereaved hearts, Lord. Those who have lost loved ones, those, Lord God, who in the midst of bereavement, touch them, God. Let them know that you're still here, Lord. Wipe the tears from their eyes and comfort them from the inside out. We pray, Lord God, that you would continue to bless as only you can. Now, God, we ask a blessing upon the service today. We ask, Holy Spirit, that you would move in this place. We ask that you would have your way in this house. For this house of prayer belongs to you. Rest, rule, abide in us, Lord God. Give us the inclination. Give us the intuitiveness, the intellect, to not only to be hearers of the word, but to be doers of the word. Allow us to apply that which we learn today. Give us the energy to spread it abroad to all of our friends, all of our family, all of those who need a word even in these dark days. And we'll be careful to give you praise, to give you honor, and to give you glory. Now, God, as always, we're in your care. Continue to have your way. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say, amen. Come on and give God some praise. Come on and give God some praise. I said, come on and give God some praise. I know it's just a couple of us here, but God is still worthy of the praise. He's still worthy of the praise, even though there's we're only few in number. Even though we're only few in number. Amen. Grab your Bibles and turn with us to... Romans, 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 chapter 1. As I mentioned on last week, we're going to be spending some time in the book of Romans. And I'm going to deem, to determine that this lesson for the next several weeks will be called excerpts from the book of Romans. Excerpts from the book of Romans. In Romans chapter 1, Romans chapter 1. Last week we were in Romans chapter 5. This time I want to go all the way back to the beginning. In Romans chapter 1, beginning at verse 1, these words are recorded. I'm reading from the New Living Translation of the Bible. This letter is from Paul, a slave of Christ Jesus, chosen by God to be an apostle and sent out to preach his good news. God promised this good news long ago through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Verse 3, the good news is about his son. In his earthly life, he was born into King David's 
family line. Finally, verse 4. And he was shown to be the son of God when he was raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. He is Jesus Christ, our Lord. From those verses, specifically verse 3 and 4, I'd like to use as a focal point this morning, for the few minutes we have left, the significance of him. The significance of him. And of course, the him that I'm speaking about is Jesus Christ himself. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. The significance of him. In the age of social media, one might ask, why would people take so much time to share information that in many cases some would deem as personal and private with folk who are irrelevant and immaterial in the big scheme? Of things. I would say because we are in this current time, different than any other time, probably in the history of the world, in which people are striving to appear more significant than they really actually are. We live in a day and time where people want to present themselves as important, as noteworthy, and as significantly substantial. For many, their way of devising a plan to prop themselves up is to go onto social media platforms and to brag about things that they don't have friends they've never met, possessions that they could never afford, and yet they want to present themselves as being significant. They determine their significance by handbags, by designer clothes, by foreign sports cars. And these things in and of themselves are not bad, but when you're trying to present an affront to make yourself look like you're something that you're really not or that you have something that you really don't, you put yourselves in a very compromising position. When you desire the praise and the adulation of others, you put yourself in a position where now you have to continue to dance and to sing for the applause and for the pats on the back. Can you imagine how Jesus would have been talked about and ostracized if his ministry took place in a time when social media was as popular as it is? They'd have called him poor. They'd have said he was a beggar. They would have said, that he was dirty because he washed the feet of others. They would have said he hung out with the wrong folk because Jesus was not fancy, he was not flashy, and he was not flamboyant. And yet the modern-day church, that seems to be all we focus on. We want to be fancy Christians. We want to be flashy Christians. And we want to be flamboyant Christians. But if we stop and think for a moment, Jesus was significant without doing any of that. He's significant in the fact of how he lived. He was significant in the fact of how he spoke. He was significant in about the way he showed compassion to those who were less fortunate. And I believe it behooves the people of God to know what is the significance of him. The scripture before us today says specifically in the first two verses, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle. 
separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. The gospel of the New Testament is the fulfillment of the promise of the Old Testament. In Genesis, God spoke of the heel of the woman's offspring crushing the head of the serpent. In Genesis 3.15, it was speaking about Jesus. And the Messianic Psalms portray the coming deliverer specifically in Psalm 45 and Psalm 72. It was speaking of Jesus. And Jeremiah, he spoke of a new covenant in Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31 through 34. He was speaking of Jesus. The Old Testament continually points beyond itself to a time of fulfillment, a time that was yet to come, and it was all leading up to the birth and the ministry of Jesus Christ. God made his promise through his prophets in the Old Testament. He trusted his message to men chosen to speak on his behalf. What the prophets wrote became the Holy Scriptures or the Holy Word or the Bible as we know it. Scripture, though, originated with God. It is God's words in which the men wrote down. It is from the mind and the mouth of God. And that is the reason the Bible tells us in 2 Timothy that all Scripture is profitable for us because it came from the mind and the mouth of the God that we serve. The Bible tells us that these prophets communicated the will of God, and eventually it was accomplished when, in the fullness of time, Jesus came. But what makes him so significant? What, what is it that Paul describes here in Romans chapter 1, beginning at verse 2, that ought to capture the attention of God's people? What is it in the Word of God that spells out for us the significant aspect of knowing God's Word and believing that God has called us in to this great and marvelous work of ministry, of kingdom building, what should we as believers know and understand that gives us power and gives us authority? What is it that we ought to know that ought to have us standing up in the midst of bad situations, speaking out on behalf of the God that we serve? What is it that ought to be able to wipe the tears from your eyes in the midnight hour knowing that God did not make a mistake when he called you in to the kingdom but that the God that we serve is significant in every aspect of his being. Let me share with you a couple of things and we're done. The Bible says there in verse 3, look at verse 3. Verse 3, the Bible says concerning his son, Jesus, our Lord. The New Living Testament says the good news about his son. The Bible goes from verse 2 where Paul says God promised his good news long ago through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. In verse 3, he immediately says for us the good news is about his son. Here is the first thing. Jesus is the revealed one. That makes him significant because he is the revealed one. The Old Testament is the telescope that points us to the Savior in the New Testament. The Bible tells us there the word concerning used in this verse in the Greek word is peri. It is the preposition, and from this word, we get the word peri, we get periscope and perimeter in the English language. It means that which encircles or surrounds. The gospel encircles or surrounds the Lord Jesus Christ. You cannot read the word of God without picturing in your mind Jesus Christ. Christ. It circles and surrounds 
him. Every story, every word, every antidote, every analogy, every metaphor is centered around and encircles Jesus Christ. If you go from Genesis all the way to Revelation, every book contains something about him. The purpose of the Bible was to share the story of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The gospel of the New Testament is the same good news of God which was promised in the Old Testament. Jesus Christ is the subject and the author of the gospel. In other words, he wrote a letter about himself. I don't, I don't know about you, but sometimes when we write a letter to somebody, we may inform them of how we're doing. The entire letter of the word of God was written by Jesus, and it's about him. We have the word of God that is written, and we have the word of God that will be revealed. It is revealed in the fact that God has made us a promise that that which happened in the Garden of Eden would be rectified. It would be dealt with. It was just a matter of time where the enemy thought he had won, but yet there was one who was coming. When you look at the throne room of heaven, after you go through the entire Old Testament, God had already prophesied in Genesis chapter 3 15 that the, the child of the woman would bruise the head of the serpent and he was speaking about Jesus Christ himself everything is leading up to him it was revealing him before he even came on the scene have you ever read a good book and you're trying to figure out how it's going to end have you ever read or watched a good movie and you has twists and turns and you're trying to figure out how it's going to end but the fact of the matter is God already tells us in Genesis how it's going to end that Jesus is going to come and he's going to deal with the serpent he's going to deal with bells above he's going to deal with the one who comes to kill to steal and to destroy he's going to deal with him once and for all but the gospel began a long time ago leading up to what God was going to do the Bible for tales, the Bible foresees, the Bible forecasted the coming of the gospel of God's son, Jesus Christ. Mark tells us in Mark chapter 1, verse 1 through 3, that the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the son of God, as it is written in the prophets, behold, I sent a messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. The purpose of the gospel family is to reveal and to unveil the Son of God. Why would that be so important? Because if you've seen the Son, you've seen the Father. In other words, God is saying, I'm going to send my Son so you can see him in the flesh and you can experience him in the spirit because the more you see see him and the more you experience in him it is the same as if you were seeing me as the father or experiencing me as the father it is important that we understand that the significance of Jesus is the fact that he is the revealed one as bad as things may seem there is a revealed one and he is the son of God as bad as things may appear to be there is a revealed one and he is the son Son of God. As hopeless as the world may seem, there is a revealed one, and he is the Son of God. He's the Son of God. He is the revealed one. The prophecies of Christ were not only in words to be actually identified by chapter and by verse, it was something to behold and something to experience. The story of him was written in the history in the era across the face of deserts and ruins of ancient cities and splendor of great civilizations and fortunes and failures of a chosen people. All along, God was exposing, he was educating the world to the word which is his beloved son. The Bible tells us in Luke chapter 
1, verse 35, And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. He was prophesying even in the Old Testament and it comes into the New Testament that which was going to happen. From Genesis to maps, every book of the Bibles is expounding upon and explaining and expanding and explicating the revealing of Jesus Christ as God. The Bible in its entirety speaks of the significance of him. He was prophesied of and later revealed throughout the entire Bible. The Bible reveals his glory when it says the Lord is high above all nations and his glory is above the heavens. It was revealing Jesus Christ. The Bible reveals his love when it says but God commendeth his love towards us that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us. That was revealing Jesus Christ. The Bible reveals his power when it says, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Jesus was being revealed. His grace was being revealed. His perfection was being revealed. His titles was being revealed. His accomplishments was being revealed. And his return was being revealed. Jesus is the revealed one. That's what makes him so significant. But not only is he the revealed one, he is the reigning one. Yeah, look back at your Bible. Look back at your Bible. The Bible says in the second portion of verse 3, in his earthly life, he was born into King David's family line. Hmm. The message of the gospel concerns Jesus not only as the revealed one, but as the reigning one. He is Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. In the New Testament, it begins, in some cases, ends with a reference to Jesus Christ as the Son of of David. In Matthew chapter 1 verse 1, the Bible says the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. In the last chapter of Revelation, Revelation chapter 22 verse 16, the Bible says, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. The messianic line was exhausted in Jesus using the various genealogies of the Old Testament. Both Matthew and Luke trace his rightful claim to the throne of King David. It is significant that at Calvary, no one cared to accept Isaiah's challenge and declare his generation. Isaiah chapter 53 verse 8 says that if they had done so, it would have been a public proclamation of Jesus's sole right to the throne of David. He was in actuality, in reality, the king of the Jews. Paul states right, uh, Christ's right to reign in two ways. The first way he states it is positionally. He says here, which was made of the seed of David according to to the flesh. He is the seed of David. He is the seed of David. It is positional because he comes through the lineage of King David. If you trace the line of Christ all the way back to the Old Testament, it was the one whom God loved, the one who had a heart for the things of God, King David, that the bloodline runs all the way into the New Testament to Jesus Christ. Positionally, the Jews cannot argue with the fact that Jesus is connected to King David. They cannot argue with the fact that he is connected to Abraham. That is the reason Matthew, a Levi, a Jew, wrote the New Testament being inspired by God, his book, 
traces Jesus back immediately to the Old Testament. He said, listen, you can't argue about this because we're telling you that he is connected. Let, let me tell you something. Sometimes it feels good being connected to the right people. That's another thing about social media. People will post pictures of folk they really don't know. They may have met them one time and stood in line for hours to get a picture and they'll post it on social, social media like them and the other person are friends. But guess what? Jesus is connected to Abraham. He's connected to David. And more importantly, guess what? You're connected to Jesus. You may not be in the bloodline, but the blood has covered you anyway and brought you in to be a part of the family. Is there anybody in here that knows not only is he the revealed one, but he is the reigning one. He is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. There's nobody higher than Jesus because he is the one who came to the line that God revealed in the first place and he is the reigning king. Not the president of the United States. Not the governors of the state. Not the senate. Not the council. Not the assembly people. But Jesus is my king. And guess what? When you know who your king really is, you can walk in the kingdom knowing that you know somebody. Knowing that somebody is out there vouching for you. Knowing that you got somebody that's on your side. Is there a believer in the house? Is there a believer online? Is there a believer in the kingdom? Is there a believer in the city that can declare, he is my king. He is my Lord. He's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. It reveals the fact that Jesus is. But not only is he the revealing one, he is the reigning one. It is positional. But not only is it positional, it is personal. The Bible says, and he declared to be the son of God with power. Huh. With power. He is Jesus Christ, our Lord. Not only does it reveal Christ as the one of God, it also shows Christ that he is the reigning one of God. But then lastly, the third thing is, Jesus is the resurrected one because the Bible says, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. Let me say that again, according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. The New Living Translation says, and he was shown to be the son of God when he was raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. He is Jesus Christ, our Lord. The expression spirit of holiness suggests that the Lord Jesus lived a life of victory over the power of sin. And indeed, his life was perfectly holy. Jesus did not know sin because Jesus never sinned. The only sin that Jesus ever took upon himself was the sin on Calvary's cross, the sin of all of us, and the sin of the entire world. Jesus never looked with lust. Jesus never uttered a hasty word. Jesus never said anything that was unkind. Jesus never said Said anything that was untrue. Jesus never did anything that was frivolous. Jesus never entertained an impure thought. He was never accused by conscience, never inflamed by wrongful passion, never out of step with the will of God. Every step he took while he was here on the earth was in the step in the order in which his father would have him to go. He did not know what it meant to have a thought that was afar off. He did not know what it was to have anger or to have frustration in his spirit. He did not know what it was to try to lie to uncover something or to get out of a situation. Every hour that Jesus spent, every minute that he spent, every second that he spent on earth was time that was well used. He did not waste 
time. His talents never debased for selfish reasons. His influence was never bad for himself and or that from others. His judgment was never wrong because he is the resurrected one. The time that he was here, he went forth as an example before the world. Why is it that so many of us gravitate to people who are bad or negative examples? Why is it that so many of us look at people with allure and with grandeur because they curse or they dress provocatively? Why is it that so many of us lean toward those who have a corrupt spirit about them and they have a bit character in their nature when the fact of the matter is God is the one that I'm supposed to be like let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus he went about doing good are you doing good today he went about speaking positively are you speaking positive today he went about being compassionate are you compassionate for others today there's something about the resurrected one that ought to inspire you you and encourage you to do things the right way and wouldn't it be good if the world stood up and began to act with some character and act with some integrity and act with some honor wouldn't it be good if the neighborhood stepped up and started taking care of the seniors and started taking care of the baby wouldn't it be good if the church folk started doing what they're supposed to do and showing up when they're supposed to show up and calling in when they're supposed to call in and giving to the house of God the way they're supposed to give. There's something about the resurrected one that ought to inspire us to do the right thing. Jesus did not waste time. He didn't have to apologize for anything. He did not have to retract not even a single word because everything that he did and everything that he said was determined by walking in the spirit of God. It is never too late and it is never too soon for us to change our behavior and stop being wishy-washy believers straddling the fence when we understand the significance of the resurrected one. Jesus lived on earth approximately 12,000 days, and every one of them was a marvel, was a walk in holiness. He was holy. He was harmless. He was undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 26 tells us, from the summit on the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus could have stepped straight into glory. He had absolute victory from the moment he drew his first breath in a barn in Bethlehem until the moment he closed his eyes in the death of the cross at Calvary. He was declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness. He lived as a man for 30 some odd years and never sinned. Some of us can't go a day without sinning. Some of us can't even go an hour without thinking a bad thought. But the God that we serve for 33 plus years walked around and encountered every Everything that we encounter was attempted in every fashion as we are and yet sin not. And if he can do it, he has inspired us to be able to do it. There's something about knowing the power of God. It gives you authority in the realm of the earth. There's something about knowing what I can do in Christ, rather what I can do in the world that ought to encourage and inspire us to step up our game and begin to do things differently. Paul says in Romans chapter 7 I am a sinner. This flesh I have to battle every day. There's something about my old nature that keeps cropping up on me. Even when I'm not thinking about bad stuff, bad stuff seems to show up at my doorstep. But thank God for Romans chapter 8 because the Bible says there's now no more condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. In other words, as bad as I was, 
God has still redeemed me, reconciled me, and now, because I know better, I ought to do better. Is there anybody who knows you know better now? You ought to do better now. You ought not to be caught up in the foolishness of your past the way it was five years ago and ten years ago, but the more you walk with God, the better you ought to be for God. The more you talk to God, the better you ought to be for God. The more time you spend with God, the better you ought to be for God. The more time I meditate on God, the better I ought to be for God. The more time I read God's word, the better I ought to be for God. Do you understand the significance of him? He is the resurrected one, and because he got up with all power in his hand, I have some power in my life. Is there anybody in here that operates in power? I have power. I have authority. Why? Because God is dwelling in me. It's not because of where I live. It's not because of my education. It's not because of my money. It's because the resurrected one is operating in my life. Somebody ought to shout amen. He's operating in my life. Somebody ought to shout hallelujah. He's operating in my life. Somebody ought to shout glory to God because the resurrected one is alive and well. Everybody else that has died is still dead, but not Jesus. Yeah, my Bible tells me he checked in to the grave on Friday. And he stayed there Friday and Saturday. At some point between Friday and Sunday morning, the Bible tells me he went down to hell and they were having a party. And he knocked on the door because the God that I serve is always civil. He's always polite. And he waited for the devil to come and open up the door. And the devil had the keys to hell in his hand. And Jesus snatched the keys from him, went back to the grave and set up talking to his father. But on Sunday morning, morning he walked out as they rolled the stone away with all power and with all authority he is the resurrected one stop thinking that your life is defeated stop thinking that your life means nothing Jesus is the resurrected one he is the revealed one in that he reveals unto us who God is. He is the personification of God. He reveals to us God in his person, in his power, in his providence. He is the revealed one. But not only is he the revealed one, he is the reigning one. You cannot deny he comes from earthly Royalty. But Jesus is a double barrel shotgun. Because not only does he come from earthly royalty, he comes from heavenly royalty. He is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords. He is the revealed one. He's the revealed one. Read his word, it will reveal unto you who he is and what he's about. But it will also reveal to you that he's the reigning one. That he's the one who sits high and looks low. He's the one who's seated at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for us even now. But he's also the resurrected one. So there would be no lies and no cover-ups. Jesus walked around so people could see him when he got up from the grave. People can say Confucius is not dead. As a matter of fact, one of the greatest myths for many years now has been Elvis Presley is still alive. Bring him and let me see him for myself. But Jesus is still alive. 
How do you know? He lives. He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. Walks with me, talks with me. Along the narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. He's the revealed one. He's the reigning one. And he is the resurrected one. God has spoken. Let the church say, Amen. Stand with us. He lives. He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. Say it with me. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives. He lives salvation to win more. You ask me how. Yes, Jesus. Mm. Within. Bless your Lord. Bless your Lord. Listen to me today. Those of you who are streaming with us. Those of you who checked in for a moment today. Whatever your situation is, whatever your circumstance is, listen to me. No matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, no matter who has hurt you or who you've hurt, today is a day to get it right. And you have an opportunity today to get it right. All you have to do is accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and I'm telling you, he will come in and you will know immediately the difference. The Bible tells us in Psalm 34, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. In other words, Jesus says, just try me and see won't I do everything I tell you I'm capable of doing. Today I'm praying that you would just try him, that you would just try him for yourself. Pray this prayer with me today. God, we thank you and we praise you for that which our ears have heard, that which our eyes have seen, that which our hearts have felt. But the fact of the matter is, God, there's people that's listening right now. There are some who are watching us right now who may not know you in the pardon of their sins. They are living a defeated life when you have promised to give us victory. They are living a hopeless life when you've promised to give us hope for the future. So God, I pray right now that they would confess in their spirit that Jesus Christ is Lord, that they would believe in their hearts that God the Father has raised him from the dead. And your word tells us that no matter where they are, if they do that, they shall be saved. God, I pray that you would touch right now as only you can. Convict the hearts and the minds of those who are watching us from afar. And we'll be careful to bless and to praise you. Amen. Now listen, if you prayed that prayer, I'm telling you it's as simple as that. If you prayed it and you believe it, today salvation is yours. You just walked out of darkness into the marvelous light. Listen, family, we love you. We appreciate you. We thank God for you. We miss you more than words can even express. Don't forget in the midst of this 2020 experience and all of your being and all of your doing and of all of your getting. God will be glorified. God bless you. Hello, family. It's Pastor Thomas. And First Lady Kim. I want to thank you for tuning in today. And I pray that the word of God has touched your heart and met you at your point of need. We appreciate the time that you took to tune in to our service today. Also, to those of you who are part of the Mount Sinai family, words cannot begin to express how much we appreciate you, how much we love you, and more importantly, how much we miss you. To those who are listening in other states and other countries, we thank God for your presence. We thank God for your believing in this small church in San Pedro, California. And we pray that you don't let this opportunity to tune into the service to take the place of real ministry where you can go and be involved in a church that's doing kingdom building where you live at, where you're located at. 
Be sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram for the podcast, live stream, and for any church announcements. One other thing, family, before we go, listen to those of you who've been given into the kingdom. We appreciate your support. We appreciate your financial commitment to the church. Don't forget, family, we have an obligation to support the ministry. And for many of you, you've done that and you've done it well. We've not missed a beat in the last four months. But for those of you who've not been as committed, I pray that God would inspire and touch your heart that you would also continue in your obligation. Listen, family, don't forget in this 2020 experience and all of your being and all of your doing and in all of your getting, God will be glorified. God bless you, family. I can't stop.